Okay, okay, we're recording. It is uh, March 21st. Hard to believe. It's springtime. Uh, and it feels like it here in Denver. And this yeah. is the uh, live edge demo and discussion. I'm Tim Quast. Brian Wilson, market strategist, is here. We're going to divide and conquer, as we like to do. I'll cover the fr front half, I think. Sorry about that, Brian. And uh, and Brian will pick up the, the second half. And as I said, we, we there were a couple of little things. So if you're on the platform and you're like, what is there? Something's not displaying. We are aware of this. Uh, so so uh, know that we are. OK, so I want to talk about, as ever, our our examples. Uh, and I'm just going to give you one right off the bat. That'll be a good good tie in to what we're trying to do. Uh, let's see. We've got we need to mute somewhere. In I'll, here. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it. Tim. OK, I think it's I think I've got it. Oh, you got it. OK. OK, Bert, take no offense if we mute you. <laughs> OK. All right, here, let me share my screen. Okay. All right. I'm, ah, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now you should see my screen. And, and when I say I want to talk about examples, I want to put them in context of this. This should now be on your uh, dashboard. Again, there may be some caching issues. I think we're going to have to do a sweep through. And when I say caching, the, the platform we use it is, is designed to go retrieve information and furnish it to you, not retrieve information and furnish it to everybody who may be connected to the platform at the same time. It's very efficient, but it means there can be caching issues that we have to sort out. Bear with us, meaning you could load something and like the graph doesn't display. If you hit control R, by the way, um, you know, if you're in here, this it's a really easy way to sort of dump the cache. And that may happen like, uh, you know, if a graph doesn't pick up, that'll be the reason. Um, so I want to show you how to use these daily trading ideas. And I'm going to start this way, like energy is in here, 100 percent probability. I I bought it March 19. It was in this portfolio. And it will show you the preceding closing price and the volatility and an entry range that is basically down half that half the volatility. That is, if you if it moves intraday high and low from you know three and a half percent, then what we're calculating here is basically you know seven one point seven percent from here. So that's around sixty five ninety seven. And you, they don't have to be perfect. The bar is very unstable, and prices are continuously changing. NRG trades tens of thousands of times a day. And remember, only 5% of trades complete. The other 95% are canceled. So the amount of quoting and pricing and everything that's going on is enormous. And that's because everybody uses algorithms, algo wheels to take big orders and spray them everywhere and try to get them within uh, the right, uh, you know, these small price differences. And so it has an effect. But, I, you know, you'd be looking for an entry range here and then an entry an exit range just up 2% from that. And, it, you know, you could you could get more. What we're trying to do is, is to say mathematically, if you're very disciplined, you can take small gains and repeat them over and over. And it's a very effective way to go about trading in the market because you want to be right as often as you possibly can. And it doesn't always work out. And I've shared, you know, my, the uh, the times when I have failed to uh, follow the math. So I have these. So here's what I did. Um, so I bought this. I bought 299 shares. Why 299? I look like an algorithm. That's all. I got to keep it in a certain range. You don't have to do that, you know. So it's just what I did. Bought it at the market. So one penny spread. Why would I put in a limit order? I know I'm going to get. Price improved to the, basically the midpoint of the uh, of the uh, order. So this was my sell. So I sold it at 625.23, exactly two percent. I bought it at um, 63.95, exactly. You don't have to do it exactly. It just happened that it was there. It was at 63.95, which was the lower end of the entry range, and I bought it at the 8:36 my time on Tuesday, and then I went and worked out. 
And while I was working out, my order filled at 65. I did put a limit order in because I'm not going to be there. I didn't put I didn't put a stop in because I was confident that it was going to move my direction. Sometimes when you when you put in both, a machine's going to come through there and know it. I'm not I'm not advocating that you do that necessarily. I'm just saying I was comfortable doing that. And sure enough, you know, within an hour, I had made my 2%. That's all I care about. How long did that take me? 30 seconds. It's all the time I spent. I didn't spend any time looking at screens. All I did was go energy is 100% probability. There's my range. There's my uh, exit range. And if I get it, I'm great. I'm not even going to do anything else. I'm happy with that. You know, if you do that every day, there's, it's really it's low stress. Don't have to do a lot of thinking. Doesn't work all the time. It's I'm going to come to context um, and uh, and what the broad market is it? BCD broad market first. The context: what is occurring? Is there a Fed meeting? And then divergence, and we can use these probabilities. You know, here was another one: VLTO, very good thing to, uh, you know, that you could do the very same thing. You know, down half the volatility to up a third of it. There's a range in there because the price is very unstable. And then you, all you want is two percent. And when and when you get your two percent, move on to something else. I mean, you could take more if you want to. There's, you know, it's just that uh, if you're after what the market will give you, what uh, in the mix of all the things going on, the arbitrage to keep an ETF that moves one percent uh, in line with a basket of stocks that moves two percent, uh, momentum stocks that move three, uh, the whole broad market that very rarely moves more than one percent. All those things present opportunities for us to, uh, to to make money. Okay, so now back to – let me get this out of the way. Go back to my platform here. And now I just want to explain these data so that you have a good basic understanding of how to use them. Notice that there are, there are sticks in here. If you go back to your dashboard, you will see that in the momentum portfolio, there are seven. So what's the difference? Well, we're only going to put the ones in here that have at least a 50% probability of producing a return. So these, if I rank them, you know, from best to worst, uh, MicroStrategy, 100%. And this, and again, there is no guarantee. This is a mathematical outcome, and I'll explain it. From 80 to 100% probability. On a probability scale, if one were making Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> I think we think we lost Tim there for a minute. Did everyone have fun with Reddit today? Who's going to take over? <laughs> we'll see if we'll see if Tim comes back here in the next thirty seconds or so. Um, yeah, I haven't been following Reddit. I saw it was it uh, cruised higher, but I haven't. Followed it after that. No, it's down to 45. I got it at 47 when it went up, got out at 53, and then it tanked okay. down. It's at 45 now. Yeah. It, it it's just it it's against all my principle buying a company with zero earnings or no nothing. It's just hot air. Right. But right. I knew the momentum was there, right? Take your gains. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and jump into a couple of things while, while we're waiting to see if Tim jumps back on. Uh, 
So I'll go ahead and cover a part of what I was going to talk about today. Um, I'll actually start with a value example. Uh, Tim was going through the daily trading ideas. Uh, so just as a, as a quick reminder, what you're basically looking for here, you're generally buying stocks that are you know down half their volatility or, or thereabouts, and then looking to make you know one or two percent. Uh, over time. What I've been doing with these is I've, I've just been ranking them by probability and, and you can do whatever you feel is appropriate. Uh, I've generally, when I've been testing it, have been uh, taking the ones that are you know roughly 90% and higher and then including them in a portfolio that I just watched during the course of the day. So I would toss VRT, MSTR, NO, NRG in that portfolio and then do the same thing uh, with the uh, low volatility. You can toss all of them uh, in there if you want to, you know, just recognize that with some of the names, you know, uh, this is not as good of a probability if you bought UMP as you do if you bought Amazon. Now, of course, this is looking at da uh, data here over the last uh, 90 days, conditions do change, but that's kind of what that's looking at. Uh, I mentioned a kind of a value play that I did, and I did it the, uh, last week. I bought some Apple shares, and let me figure out the best way to get to it. Oh, this happened earlier. Okay, control. Tim's control R works, works well. Uh, <laughs> you saw that just happened with me. Uh, so I bought Apple last week is it's more of a value investment. Hold on to it for a little while. The reason that I did is Apple was just starting to come off of a one and you can see that short volumes were low. And with that type of trade, um, you know, normally we advocate, you know, take your profits. Since Apple was very oversold, I was looking at it as more of a slightly longer term play. So I actually held it up until uh, today, and then we had news in the name today, and I sold it early uh, this morning and got out of that position. But that's one way that you can approach things from a, let's call it a value investment play, looking at things that have might that you might hold on to just a little bit longer. I would have continued to hold on to Apple uh, if they didn't have today's news, and maybe after that news sorts out, you know, maybe I'll jump back into it. We'll we'll see what happens in the uh, in the data as we take a look at it. But as we're talking about that, that's just a good reminder as well. You know, whenever you're picking up something or looking at a possible uh, order, uh, check the news. You know, I was looking at Apple earlier today because it was it was down on the day, right? It was down. I think I was probably looking in here. It was down one and a quarter percent, something like that. I'm like, oh. Apple's down, you know, I love its divergence. Uh, you know, maybe I should pick up some shares. You know, went to take a quick look, you know, it, is there any news? You know, saw that there was the antitrust suit. I'm like, okay, for now, I'm gonna get out of that position, uh, protect my profits, I might look at it later. So, you know, just as a reminder, if something is moving contrary to what the group should be doing, you know, sometimes that's a reason for you to take a second look at it before, you know, jumping in. In this case, it had great divergence coming into the day, but obviously if we would have stepped into that position, you'd be down, you know, three or 4% right now. Uh, so hopefully uh, that concept makes sense. Let me shift back to uh, the overall portfolio here. Move back to my dashboard. Uh, I mentioned this in my note this morning, and Barry, I know that you have a short portfolio, and maybe you can speak into what you do here in a moment. But I'll I'll show you what what I do. In hey, sorry case. guys, I lost you somewhere in there. I don't even know where I lost you. <laughs> somewhere yeah, no, in there. No worries, Tim. I I just picked up. If you want to okay. if you want to pick back up, because uh, mm -hmm. I know you got to go pretty soon, uh, okay. and then uh, I can pick it pick it back up again uh, after that. What was the last thing you heard? <laughs> uh, you you were discussing the uh, the portfolio, uh, the new trade ideas. 
okay, and did I and I didn't get very far, right? I can wrap you, this you up in, in in a couple of minutes. Yeah, you did didn't, you? You didn't get very far. I kind of took over a little bit on on the same concept. Okay, I do not know what happened there. I didn't even know I'd lost you for a bit. So uh, let me finish this off, and you can just explore it, and you will see. But uh, what I was saying is, low volatility is going to track the. I, I I'm probably way ahead. Let me go back here. Momentum. Uh, did did you catch the part where I said we're gonna have to do this again? <laughs> so, uh, the, you know, sometimes the magic works, sometimes it doesn't. There will be a difference. Because, did you get that part? The difference will be we're only we only want the ones with probability of fifty percent or better. Low volatility is going to be the same way. You can you know if it's 50, you can make the cut with fifty percent or better uh, uh, probability, but clearly you want to be as cl close to the upper end of this as possible. Mathematically, we're looking, you know, at a fairly. Did you catch that part? A limited data set, 90 days, because everything changes. Uh, it, it, a yeah. long data set isn't going to help. Okay, good. Um, let me then just very quickly show you this. The probability view, we can do it by table or by probability. And it just, you know, makes it very easy to interact with. If you click through Hilton, I think that's what that is. Um, and it will just take you right to this core data for an easy, you know, easy decision making. This is for today, last close, entry range, exit range. And that's looking one to five days, you know, and it's what, what I was, I think what we lost was I was noting how when demand and supply separate, that's where you get more probability of the price moving up and you get more volatility and you have a better chance of capturing a piece of that. That's what we're after. Then we also, of course, include broad sentiment. This is, and I, in some ways, I think it's not properly emphasized here. That shouldn't be appearing. This we've removed. So there's another thing. Uh, and this is where I'll wrap up and hand over to you, Brian. And, and you, maybe you and I can talk about this a little bit. You know, what comes next? And how is it that monetary policy parent changes. I mean, if, you know, so you have a Fed meeting and you have dramatically rising supply and demand that has been running right at the red line, right at the red line, very, you know, the market hasn't moved much. And then it begins to tail off and the market shoots up on monetary policy. So what is it? Was well, as of today, you couldn't look at it and say it's short covering per se. You could if you looked at SPY. I thought this was kind of interesting. You look at SPY, that, you know, this is a this is a pretty big short hedge. So I look at this and say some of what we're getting is a squeeze on the hedge. And there ha that hedge has been underused to us, the way we look at all the data. So I don't know. I you know, I won't maybe there's some confirmation bias here because I did put on a short today. Does the market, does, does it shrug all of this off and continue higher? Well, it's certainly possible. Mathematically, it's very unlikely. It has happened, and it's only happened uh, a, a, a very rare period of times over the entire data set. Once is in the last three months uh, around monetary policy change. Uh, and that's where no matter this you know, the, the, the broad market sentiment signaling the probability of a decline, the market, uh, sh you know, it continues higher anyway, because the mechanics, the market structure uh, has changed. So we'll see. I don't, you know, I don't know. I think that there's a very high probability uh, that it falters, but I don't know. You know, we'll see. Be right or wrong. Um, and uh we will all find out in short order. Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, I can hang around for about another five minutes. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> so, sounds good. Uh, we, I had talked about uh, an example for, from my portfolio of, of using Apple as a value play, but then just making sure to check the news because I sold it this morning, you know, with with news of the of the DOJ. So just a reminder to check news and the fact that edge can not only be used for intraday opportunities, but also, you know, a little bit longer uh, term opportunities as well. Uh, Barry, I will ask for your input here in just uh, just a moment. What I wanted to show you guys was uh, 
the names in my experimental short portfolio are starting to increase. I should start to track this on a daily basis just to know the numbers. This was five or six a couple of days ago. So in the middle of getting a huge ramp up in the market, we're getting a lot more short opportunities at the same time. Now I'll, I'll share with you, and you can take a screenshot of this if you want, it's nothing fancy. It's just taking the exact opposite of our momentum portfolio. Uh, and I think Barry, one area that you might differ is this is picking up market structure sentiment that's moving below four. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think sometimes with yours, you're correcting, you're picking up ones that move, say from ten to nine. The, the very early part of those moves lower is is um, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I sent you my uh, my screenshot, so I want to catch them as they're coming off the high, and so I right. use I use momentum, low volatility, and what I call momentum down is kind of indicators. So, you know, typically when I see momentum has, you know, what we saw just a few weeks ago, like 35 names in it, whatever, it has 26 names. I'll, in my down, I'll have like five names, but then now I have the inverse where now my momentum down is 26 names. So I kind of use this as kind of a balancing whether I'm going long or I'm going short. Mm -hmm. But again, the same philosophy. I just use the inverse. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Thank, thanks for that input. I just wanted to introduce that short portfolio because we are at a little bit of a uh, tug of war right now. Uh, you, you know, as Tim just uh, you know shared with you, you know where do we you know where do we go from here? Uh, if we look at what was happening across the market yesterday, and I'll, I'll share my screen again. I, I had a question. Please. Well, yep. Which, which which is when we're looking at this, what kind of a time horizon? Given the fact that we're going to make an entry in a few minutes or something, what kind of a time horizon are we looking at? Day trade, swing trades, you know, 30 days, six months. What what's sort of the sure time sure? Horizon it, for, it, 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 and it Terry, really it's nice to on, see you. Thank thank yes. you for your thank yeah, you for your ahead, emails. Tim. Thank you yeah. for being here. Appreciate that. Uh, Tim, did you want to uh, well, step into that question? Well, I didn't mean to step in front of you. Yeah, I'm you're, so you're fine. There, there are there are multiple ways to use edge for the daily trading ideas. We say one to five days that you're yeah. after. It's a very short term. I guess it would be closest to a swing trade. You know, I the 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 reason there is we're trying to take what the market will give us, and you can't outcompete machines that are trading intraday. They have better information, better technology. You know, big, big institutional money tends to move things in five-day increments. I know this from e almost every angle, uh, from transition management for portfolios. I was on a call yesterday with a State Street team responsible for that. They have a five-day target. So big money tends to move that way. So if we're one to five days, we're right where we have the least competition. Now, if you're managing money overall, you know, and I do this with my advisors. If you have longer term portfolios, where would you increase or decrease your exposure? If you know, if you don't have, if you don't prefer to, you know, trade short term, it's too stressful. And I understand. I get stressed out shorting stuff. You know, <laughs> I prefer those trades like energy. That was perfect to me. Uh, but then you're going to look at the the those cycles tend to run probably closer to 20 days. And you say, that's not even very long. You could be a longer cycle than that. But I would, Brian, you know, actually, I'll do this and then I got to run. But just if we look at broad sentiment, this will tell you, you know, if you look at this is what's not working, by the way, I'm going to go. I noticed this. It's and I sent a note to the chief engineer on this. Let me go over here and do this and I'll show you, Carrie, what I mean. Uh, I'm go back know, to mute. OK, thank thank you for your question, too. Um, let me refresh that. OK, and then here. And here. OK, here's what I I just want to note about the the length of time. I mean, sorry, Brian, I'm going to move you um, and let me expand this out to a year. So here's how you could think about this longer term. I, you know, so long as broad market sentiment is above five, you know, you're in, you're in good shape. You know, if, if sentiment begins to deteriorate, those may be times to reduce exposure. 
Um, of course, and if it's a longer term portfolio, the beautiful thing is every time we're below the green line, that tends to be a great entry point. It was true back here. It was true here if we expand the time frame out. So if you're managing long term portfolios, you know, when the market goes above that red line, it tends over the long term to be a point where you would want to reduce your exposure to the equity market. When it drops below the green line, you know you can generally put money to work. There are occasional hiccups. 2022 was pretty tough. But literally 100% of the time in the data, when sent demand drops below the green line, great time to put more money to work in the equity market. When it, hit, when it gets up here above the red line, time to reduce exposure. You know, certainly that's not been the case here, but this was a monetary policy driven event. It created extraordinary momentum that has lifted the market. I look at this now and say, we're, no matter that we've had this really nice run the last two days on the Fed, this is the kind of condition that leads to a decline. I could be wrong, but I'd look at that and say, I would want to reduce my long-term exposure to equities because of that. So that's how we think about it. Okay, I'm going to run. I have to bolt for downtown. You're in good hands with Brian. <laughs> Carrie, nice to see it. Good to see you all. John, I owe you a couple of emails. Appreciate your patience. Barry and Barry, see you guys. See you next week. Hey, Brian, I have a quick question for yes, you. Yes, absolutely, Barry. I'm comparing your your uh, momentum down filter compared to mine. You've got market structure sentiment um, equal to not equal to up, and I've got market structure sentiment trend equal to down. That's kind of the same thing, isn't it? It's kind of the same thing, yeah. Okay. Yep. I was going to play no. with it, I just know that was the one difference. Yeah, I, no no, no difference that I'm aware of there, yeah. And I tend to play the down quicker because if something's going to move, it's going to move down quickly, and then it'll grind up slowly. So I do the long side in your one to five, but on the short, on, on the downside, I play those much quicker. I don't say I'm long. Yep, makes, makes sense. Well, let me uh, let me pick up where uh, with part of what Tim was uh, discussing there. You know, one thing I wanted to just discuss is, you know, Tim had mentioned, uh, you know, FOMC changes right around in here, you know, really led to a ramp higher in the broad market. You know, the question is, at least in my mind, is will we see something similar this time? Well, let's just take a take a minute to, you know, discuss that. When we when we had the monetary changes before, sentiment was oversold. It was below the green line. We had a ramp up from oversold conditions. So that that's one change. Uh, if we look at short volumes right around that time, they were high. So they were where they were north of 50%, you know, right now they're all the way up to 51%. So from a short volume perspective, very similar setup. What ensued was short covering over the next couple of weeks and the market just took off. Uh, so a couple things to, to think about here. You know, one, do we get short covering across the market during the next one to two weeks? You know, will that, you know, lead a ramp up in the market? You know, we are, let's call it overbought right now. We're stretched right now from a market sentiment perspective. We were not stretched before. So sentiment is in a different place. Short volumes are in a similar, or short volumes are similar, sentiments different. So it is a different setup right now. We'll just have to see how this uh, proceeds. I had mentioned asset allocation money you know, really lifting equities yesterday. I think it was an 89 basis point increase uh, for the S&P uh, 500. It was about a 7% change on a day over day basis to what passive money was doing. So it was a big change across the market. Uh, so just global asset allocation strategies really jumping into equities. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably a very similar uh, dynamic in play right now. One thing to think about here over the next, let's call it week or so. Uh, one, we're dealing with very high short volumes. We'll hopefully, you know, watch for some relief there. Uh, two, we're going to be approaching both month and quarter end. So we're going to have some possible window dressing, uh, as we refer to it from an active investor perspective. 
We'll also have passive investors that will need to true up models. Uh, and, 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 and remember that on the passive investment side, not all passive investors are, are alike. If you're uh, you know, a global asset allocator, that's going to be different than a normal index fund. It, it's sometimes going to be different than ETF strategies. So in other words, uh, you know, you might have some passive investors that are doing one thing, but you know, some of this upside that we're seeing right now and today might make other passive investors overweight equities at quarter end. So bottom line is we we have a little bit of watching to do right now. Uh, we are in a high short volume environment. We'll definitely be watching that. Uh, as Tim mentioned yesterday, we did get some relief from an ETF perspective. The SPY was lower. I believe that was an 8% move lower on a day over day basis. So we did get some, uh, some good news there. Um, in terms of what I want to cover, I think I will leave it there. Uh, once again, what we want to monitor is quarter end positioning. Uh, as a reminder, next Friday will be a day off for the market with Good Friday. So the market will be will be closed next Friday. So we'll have uh, tomorrow through next Thursday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Barry, uh, we'll go ahead. Let's see. Your Okay, I guess Joe was asking this question uh, to, to you, Barry, if you could share your short momentum settings. Would you be able to do, just do a screenshot for everyone real quick? I sent you I sent you the screenshot. Oh, OK. Would you be able to just uh, you can't really share your screen. No, so okay. uh, Barry if, or Joe, if you can send me an email, um, I can I can uh, uh, forward that along to you. So happy to happy to do that. I think we covered everything else that that I wanted to cover. Uh, any other questions that that I can address in terms of what you're seeing or um, any any questions about the new features uh, that are just being introduced? Nope. Looking forward to play with them. Clear, clear, clear as mud, huh? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well. Good stuff, everyone. I, I just uh, with that, then I wish I will wish you a great uh, rest of the day. Uh, if you can make it next Thursday, we'll do this uh, one more time. That'll be right before the uh, the end of the quarter.